I started roaming through the slums of Buenos Aires at the age of nine with my mother. That started for her as a journey for personal discovery, but when she saw the inequalities of our society, that turned out into social activism. And being exposed to that in such an early age, for me, was transformational. Since then, since then for me, transforming society for good was no longer an option. And I did. I, I worked many, many years going to the same slums I went with my mother until my early 20s. And I met wonderful people along the way. Among them, I met with a, one, one of the most beautiful persons I met in my life, a name called Hannibal. He was like a short guy, strong-handed, bright eyes. He helped everybody in the community. He was also very ingenious. He was creating systems to build better houses because the construction in the slums are, it's very poor, it's very, uh, you know, it's not a good shelter. So, so he was always thinking on ways to improve his community. So he had all the qualities we could look into a human being. He was hard worker, solidarity, he had solidarity, he was kind-hearted. Nonetheless, he couldn't get out of poverty. And for, for me, that injustice stuck and still is with me. And, and when I'm saying this, I'm not saying this out of pity, because I don't have pity for him, because although he was, he was poor in material aspects, he was the richest man in the world in every other aspect. And, and luckily, that you know, uh, activist era in my life ended up in disenchantment because I saw my fellow activists start like chasing power instead of chasing our original purpose, uh, a problem that I think in our society is very general, that power corrupts or tend to corrupt people. Um, but there was another track in my life that was present since my early days, because at the age of 11, I started programming. I wanted to, to do a one-year training course for programming in basic, a forgotten language. <laughs> That's kind of ancient history, and you know, it was an adult course, so, so I, I was the only, I, I was like 11, and the following guy was 24, so the, I, I was kind of the pet in the, yes. And you know, I love technology, because you, you feel like you are like God. You give life to new things, and then somebody else uses it, and it's, it's very nice, it's like you're creating, it's pure creation. So, so technology, technology was my passion as well. So I, I keep building software, keep building things for others. Um, although I, I didn't have feedback on the consequences of what I was building, because you know, software back then was isolated, was in the hands of the user and in computers. And that was like that until in my 20s, I was hired by the main newspaper in Argentina called Clarín, and to, to build the digital media area of, of Clarín. And as part of that, they, they gave us a lot of freedom. So we started creating the website. This was 1995. So we created a website for the main newspaper in Argentina, mostly as a game, because I, I didn't have any idea of what I was doing. It was just fun <laughs> to do it. And when we released this website into the world, something amazing happened. We started having emails from people, Argentinians, all over the world saying, esto es increíble, because they were being able to know what was going on in Argentina in real time. I know you give that for granted as well today, but <laughs> you know, in the past, that was not like that. I mean, it was very tough. Like, if you were abroad, you would wait a day or two until you could know what was going on in your country. So that was 
pivotal moment in my life as well, because suddenly I realized I could put my two passions in one. I could use technology to transform society. And I did. And I started like helping entrepreneurs, mentoring them to help build their dreams. I, I created systems to improve our educational system. But there was something that that internet of information couldn't change, although it changed many areas of our society. It changed how we communicate with each other. It changed how we access to knowledge, how we have fun. But it left the excluded in our society almost untouched. The reach to them just arrived very late in the game, maybe in the last years, and giving them too little in exchange. Because we couldn't change how we transfer value. We couldn't remove the middlemen in the transfer of value. And, you know, I didn't see a solution to that until in 2012, a very good friend of mine called me all side out. He, he, he lives in the Silicon Valley. And he told me, Dieguito, you have to see this. This is awesome. And I say, okay, what it is? I mean, like, come on, what can be so awesome? And he say, okay, open an account. And to give you some context, in Argentina back then, it was almost impossible to move money back and forth from, from the country. We have strict capital controls. So no money was getting in and out. So he told me, open an account in this website. It will be a Bitcoin first time. Well, it was like the second time I heard about it, but it will be a Bitcoin account. I did that, and 10 minutes later, the amount equivalent to a small apartment in Buenos Aires appeared into that account. So I say, what? <laughs> it's like, you know, this is crazy. And, but but it, it looked like a, a game, no? So, so I send it back. You know? <laughs> I say, okay, yeah, I know. We all made mistakes, you know? It's like, yeah. So the thing is, I send it back, and he told me, no, but keep one. So you play around with it, you get to know it. And, um, and I did, and, and I say, okay, but this is like the how a true open financial system, an inclusive financial system would look. Because I didn't have to ask permission to anybody to open the account. I could interact with others without asking permission. That was the same essence of the internet of information we were chasing in the 90s. Openness, neutrality, access for everybody. So then I decided that I was going to devote my life into it. And I was like 15 days non-sleeping, reading about it. <laughs> because I, I think I still don't get it right. But you know, it's, it's like, you know, it's very tough because it's macroeconomics, it's technology, it's, uh, well, in my view, it's social scaling, it's, it's other things that go way beyond even the basic things that everybody sees in Bitcoin or blockchain and these technologies. So, as part of doing everything, I started meeting in cafes of Buenos Aires to buy and sell Bitcoin. Very scary thing. But, well, not for me, because I'm, I'm accustomed to it, but you know, it was like a, bit, a little bit risky. And then I, I had a gaming computer and started producing Bitcoins with that. That was fun. Um, and then also I started the first meetups of Bitcoin in Buenos Aires in early 2013. And I met good friends with whom that were crazy enough to, to go with me and start the Bitcoin movement in Latin America. So now we have 10 countries in Latin America with communities and meetups and people discussing these technologies, working around these technologies. Um, but in the back of my head, I still wanted to solve that problem that remind and solve from my, from my youth. I still wanted to solve the real problem for me, that it was how we could include half of our population. And I, I started trying like, to go to the slums with Bitcoin, and that was very interesting, because it was, <laughs> you cannot imagine. I mean, everything in the slums is digital economy. It's like, it's cash. 
So you, I was telling them, you know, move into this wallet, this digital cash, and also it's not pesos. It's a different currency that you never known that is from the internet that is decentralized that nobody can touch. <laughs> okay, be your own bank. <laughs> they were saying, I don't want to be my own bank. You know, I, I just need to live, thrive, protect my wealth. But it, but it was very interesting and one of the learning lessons is that when we don't need to include them, what we need is to integrate. We need to learn from each other. Because in that process of exchanging ideas and needs and everything is where a new thing will be, bo will be born. And since then, I realized we need to create, use this technology to create a digital peso or the local currency. I, I realized that we needed to have a way to settle agreements between us, because in our society, transferring value is not only transferring value, we also have agreements attached to the transfer of value. Many of you will hear about that as smart contracts, which is another interesting concept. So with some friends, we started extending Bitcoin to add a layer on top to enforce or to settle agreements among the people. And in that layer, we can also represent the local currency, or any valuable thing for the human beings, like the title of your house, and we are working on that now in the slums to give you know, a, a registry of the property of the land where they live. So we are starting to work on those ideas. And we also realized that we needed to scale this. We need to, I mean, this technology underneath Bitcoin doesn't scale well. Uh, it can serve you know, a few hundred of millions or maybe tens of millions but we need to create more technology to scale that. And we are in that process in the moment. So we started building all this technology, in my case, around the solution of a problem. It was not technology per technology per se. And I realized that this whole construction, this social and technological construction, was a new thing, a new internet for the transfer of value with the same values as the Internet of Information had. The same values of openness, of neutrality, of inclusiveness that the Internet of Information had. And this Internet of Information of Value will transform our lives in many, many ways. One of them, it will give the power of money back to the people. Now we will be able to create our own money to represent our economies, our community, the economies of our communities. It will give us a financial system that will be inclusive because it, you don't need to have a recurrent cost, a maintenance cost to have an account open in this internet of value. It will lower the transaction cost to a fraction of a cent, making tra the transaction cheap enough so anybody can transact in the world. And it will bring to life a very powerful emerging pattern that is the construction of identities based on reputation, where every action we take in our societies, every time we trade with others, every time, every time we um, help our communities, every time we learn something new, we will be able to record that into the Internet of Value in a way that we will be able to show that value to others. Because the main reason why people is excluded in our society is because they are invisible. They don't have assets, they don't have cars, houses, or, or a paycheck they can show to prove that they are worthy. But people like Hannibal is worthy. They have a lot of value in their actions, in how they contribute to the society. So now we have the tool to show others that value, to make visible for others all that value that is hidden in our society. So there are many ways in which you can participate in this internet of value. You could learn more. You can share the ideas if you like them. You can go to the slums, although there's no many slums here, but. <laughs> you know, I mean, but I think the most important thing is, and, and 
is that you start looking at the world in a new way, to start seeing that there's a new world emerging, a new society emerging, and that you come with me in this journey of creating the conditions to give the, Hannibal's, uh, the Hannibal and all the people like him in the world the opportunity to thrive and to be happy and to be an integral part of our society. Thank you.